Okay, well, we're at that stage of the course where I have to think how much uh, time we have left to cover all the material I want to cover. Uh, let us remind ourselves of some overall, the overall situation that we're in intellectually. Uh, we've rejected Cartesianism, that is the idea that really there are two kinds, two fundamentally different kinds of reality, the mental and the physical. Uh, but we've also rejected uh, the standard versions of materialism. So what are we left with? Well, that's, uh, I've been exploring some of the consequences of what we're left with, and I'm going to continue that today. Uh, but before I resume the discussion from last time, are there any uh, questions, including bureaucratic questions, about when the papers are due and all that kind of stuff? I haven't looked up when the final exam is. Uh, two weeks tomorrow, I have to go to North Africa. Um, but that's all right. My colleagues will I'll be here and will cheerfully administer the final exam. I'm not sure when it is. I might be back in time, but I, I doubt it. So we'll have to do all that stuff. Um, I, I have to cover the intellectual material essentially in the next uh, two weeks. But there will be, and I will give you um, sample exam questions. That is, you will have a, a, a set of practice questions, that have, the kind of thing that have occurred on previous exams. So there's all kinds of bureaucratic junk uh, that I haven't uh, explained to you, but I will. Uh, the other thing is that there will be a, a, a fourth optional paper if you want to, if you've handed in uh, three papers, but you're dissatisfied with one or more of your grades, or you just want to write a fourth paper, I will hand out uh, topics for a fourth uh, paper for the course. Okay, any bureaucratic questions before I resume the discussion from last time? Last time I introduced the controversial idea of the connection principle. And let me state some of the background considerations on that. The idea that people have had is that to have a genuine science of the mind, to have a science of cognition, uh, we have to have something that is neither <coughs> common sense intentionality of the uh, sort that I'm uh, such a fan of, that is beliefs and desires and hopes and fears and perceptions and intentional actions. It's not common sense intentionality and it's not neuroscience, it's not neurobiology. And the idea they have is that there's some kind of a gap between the level <coughs> of what they like to call sneeringly folk psychology uh, and the level of brain science. And the reason is, uh, I have to put it in very crude terms, common sense intentionality doesn't look like science, uh, and uh, brain science certainly looks like science, but we don't know enough about it. We don't know enough about it to know how to use it to explain human behavior. So we're going to try to find something that's in between, and you're familiar with all, of, or at least with some of the gap fillers, some of the attempts to get a science of human cognition, which is neither <coughs> common sense intentionality nor uh, neurobiology. And there are a whole bunch of those uh, of gap fillers, but the most famous is the computational theory of the mind. And the idea, there are two ideas that underlie the computational theory, namely that in human cognition, we're constantly unconsciously following rules, where there are all these rules that we're following. And secondly, they're not like the rule drive on the right-hand side of the road that you can become conscious of. They're not even the kind of thing you could become, become conscious of because they are computational rules. Uh, the rules would have to be uh, specified if we're going to do it scientifically uh, using a binary symbolism and you couldn't possibly become conscious of those. Those are not the kind of things that you could be conscious of. Now I've been attacking that picture. What I've been saying is there aren't any such rules. Um, there are <clears throat> neurobiological processes and there are conscious and unconscious mental states, but the notion of an unconscious mental state has to be the kind of thing that could be accessible to consciousness. Maybe you can't bring it to consciousness for one reason or another. Your, your memory is failing. You can't remember it. Or you got some kind of brain damage. Or it's too painful because of repression. But it has, it's got to be at least the kind of thing that you could become conscious of. 
And I gave the example of the Ponzo illusion, where the standard cognitive science explanation says you're really following two rules and making two unconscious inferences when you see the top line as longer than the bottom line, even though they're the same length. <clears throat> uh, and I argued, no, you just see the top line as longer uh, and the bottom line uh, as shorter. And it's true that you pick up various cues. Uh, the uh, the uh, converging lines give you cues, but it's a mistake to think that you are following rules. Well, why not? Well, though, rules have to operate in real time, and they have to operate in virtue of their intentional content, what I call their aspectual shape. So the rule drink water is a different rule from the rule drink H2O, uh, even though water is H2O, because they have different intentional contents. Somebody might know uh, that drinking water was H2O, but somebody might not know that. They might uh, want to follow the rule and drink water and not follow the rule drink H2O. Now I'm going to illustrate this further with some other examples. I'm going to illustrate the connection principle. <clears throat> uh, as I've told you uh, a number of times, I've had a bunch of dogs in my life. Uh, Frege, Russell, Ludwig, and Gilbert. Now, they vary in their physical skills, but the all-time champion at catching tennis balls, I've never seen a doggy uh, so good at catching tennis balls, was Russell. And we didn't uh, uh, train him to chase tennis balls. He trained us. And we got so sick of throwing tennis balls, we just refused. So any stranger comes to the house, Russell would train them to throw. You know, they get put a tennis ball in their lap and wag his tail and nod his head until finally they give in and throw it. So you, he would teach people to throw tennis balls. Now he got to be very good at catching tennis balls bounced off a wall. So you throw the uh, tennis ball against the side of the house, and Russell will go and catch the ball uh, where it bounces off of the wall. How does he do it? Well, the standard cognitive science explanation would say Russell does a prodigious amount of mathematical calculation. Uh, it's stunning, his level of mathematical sophistication. Uh, he has to follow a rule, and the rule is non-trivial. I will give you a very crude statement of the rule, but a really sophisticated statement would require much, much more mathematics uh, than I know, but it would be something like this. The rule he follows is put your mouth at a point where the angle of incidence is exactly equal to the angle of reflection. That is, the ball reflects off in a way that's equal to the angle of instance. And the ball moves in a parabolic trajectory, uh, the flatness of which is a function of the velocity of the ball on impact, uh, a minus, uh, the, a co or rather, uh, divided by the coefficient of friction, minus a certain amount for air resistance. Now notice that poor Russell has got to do an awful lot of mathematics to figure that out. And he's got to know, don't look for a catenary, look for a parabola, because the ball is going to be moving in a parabolic arc, not in a catenary. I know that because I looked it up. Uh, but you can, I mean, I may, I may be wrong about that even, you know, I, I don't trust the web anymore because I read about myself on Wikipedia and it's full of wild mistakes. In fact, I think one of the most fun exams I could give you would be, I give you a list of the uh, things that is said on the internet about the stuff we've covered in the course, you know, Searle's views about the Chinese room, and then you just go through and, and correct all the mistakes. But anyway, back to Russell uh, catching the ball. Okay, I don't think that's right. I don't think Russell represents in his mind uh, the distinction between a parabola and a catenary, and he does the mathematics necessary to figure out uh, <clears throat> the way that impact velocity will affect the parabolic curve uh, and how the parabolic curve on the, on, um, uh, the uh, reflection uh, phase of the arc uh, will be uh, altered by the change in impact, by the change in velocity that had to do with the coefficient of friction when the ball hit the wall. I don't think that's how he does it. Well, how does he do it? 
Well, frankly, I think he does what I would do if I was a doggy. And that is you try to figure out where the damn ball is going to go, and then you put your mouth where you think it's going to go. I don't have to do this. Fortunately, I have uh, uh, other means of catching balls. But that is what I think he does. And he learns, as they say, by trial and error. Why on earth would anybody think that he's doing all this mathematics? Uh, well, the answer is <clears throat> that we tend to suppose, now this is a very deep assumption, that if you have a meaningful input and a meaningful output, then the processes in between must be meaningful. That is to say, they must have a whole lot of intentional contents, a whole lot of propositional mathematical contents. Now, there is a meaningful input. He sees the ball hit the wall. And a meaningful output, he catches the ball. And it's tempting to think that there are a whole lot of intellectual processes in between uh, between uh, his uh, seeing the ball and his catching it. I think, in fact, it's a physical skill. It's like me skiing. Uh, when I ski, I do not solve a whole lot of mathematical problems having to do with the velocity of the ski, uh, the coefficient of friction of the snow, uh, and uh, the um, steepness of the hill. I take all those into consideration, but I am not going through a whole series of unconscious computational processes. I'm just doing it. Okay, now the picture then that you, that you get of the mind and its relation uh, to cognitive science on the account that I'm giving, uh, is that if you want to understand the mind, you better understand the operation of intentionality. And ideally, it'd be nice if you understood the operation of the brain. We're learning a lot more about the brain, but we have a long way to go. And as I've said, one of the great uh, merits of the past decade or so in cognitive science is that computational, the, the uh, computational cognitive science, the computational paradigm, is being replaced by a neurobiological paradigm. We're replacing computational cognitive science uh, with cognitive neuroscience, and I welcome that. I think that's exactly uh, the way to go. And, I, I, and it's not because I suddenly convinced all these guys. Uh, it's because they got much better machinery. Uh, they got enough money to buy these great magnets uh, called <clears throat> functional magnetic resonance machines and that enables us to do a lot of things that we couldn't do. If you haven't been in one of these dumb machines, you will be eventually. Uh, and I, I got into one of them. It, you feel like a cigar, okay, because you're stuffed into this big thing, and there's a hell of a lot of racket. I mean, it's sort of a nightmarish experience because it makes a lot of noise when the magnets bang around. Um, uh, but uh, they wanted to do some research on my poor brain. So I had to go to the, the uh, Veterans Administration because UCSF doesn't have the, uh, the industrial strength MRI uh, that the Veterans Admission, uh, Administration has. I had to do a TESA-4 as opposed to a TESA-3. Some of you probably knows what the, know what that means. I don't. But anyway, those bastards made me lie there for two hours. I'm the most impatient guy I know. And during that time, they played music at me. But their conception of classical music, well, it's OK, but it's kind of, you know, it's sort of Dvorak intellectual level. I mean, it's not, uh, it, it's not something uh, that you would ever go out and buy on your own. However, I did hear a lot of reasonably trashy, I won't say trashy, but, but um, kind of middle brow uh, classical I music. Mean, at least they spared me the rock concert. I didn't have to, to, to sweat through that. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, you will, at some point in your life, I'm pretty sure, be subject to this great magnet, or the magnet will tell you, give you a picture of your brain. I've got these pictures in my brain. I don't know how the hell to read them or what to make of them, but it's kind of nice to have a picture of the inside of your skull. Uh, okay, so the picture that I'm giving you is this. It's kind of, uh, to many people, it would seem an anti-intellectual picture. There's, the, there's mental processes, consciousness and unconscious, and there's the brain. Uh, but that's it. Uh, there are not a whole lot of uh, 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 
uh, un, a deep unconscious information processing or two and a half D images or primal sketches or the language of thought or all of the other uh, things that people have postulated to try to give us a science of human cognition that was neither intentionalistic nor neurobiological. My view is there can't be such a science precisely because the postulation of unconscious mental states, mental rules, which aren't even the kind of thing that you could become conscious of. They have no aspectual shape. They're just uh, uh, computational rules, sequences of zeros and ones uh, flashing through the brain at lightning speed, that that isn't uh, so much empirically unsupported as it is meaningless. Okay, now I'm going to illustrate this with another famous example. It's always, if you're going to have these kind of polemical disputes, you've got to nail them down to specific examples. And I've given you the example of the Ponzo uh, uh, illusion, and I've given you the example of the doggy uh, engaging in some intelligent motor behavior. Uh, and now I want to give you the, one, one of my favorite examples, the vestibular ocular reflex. And I want to show you what I think is the correct way uh, to analyze the VOR uh, as opposed to the incorrect way. So any questions so far? Because I've said some controversial things already. Yes, back of the room. <clears throat> Yeah, here's why. Intentionality is representation. That's, I mean, if you had to have a one sentence slogan, that's it. It's a bit misleading because we know vision and uh, uh, action give you presentations, not just representations. But intentionality is representation. When you have, a, when you believe uh, that uh, uh, Barack Obama is in Washington, you are representing a certain state of affairs. This guy being in this place. But now, and this is the crucial step, all representation is under an aspect. Uh, if I believe that the stuff in the jar is water, then that represents the stuff under a dis different aspect as if I represent it under the aspect H2O. H2O is water, but you cannot have representation without representing something under one aspect or another. Now, a lot of philosophers of language have understood this point. Frege made it famous when he gave the example of the evening star and the morning star. If you think about this uh, object in the sky under the aspect evening star, it's different from the aspect morning star, even though it's the same star in both cases. All representation is under an aspect. Now the question is, and I call it aspectual shape. Frege called it the mode of presentation. Sounds great in German. Ach, das gegeben sein. As I've told you before, you can't write German without sounding like a Nazi officer. Uh, but in any case, it's the ach, das gegeben sein. And, and for that reason, the object is presented, as it were, from one side. It's einseitig beleuchtet, says Frege. In his, you can hear him. Uh, uh, he was kind of a right-wing nut in, in his political views, so I like to think that he had this style of speaking. Uh, but <laughs> I, he was a great genius. I mean, we're all heirs uh, to Gottlob Frege. Every time you turn on your computer, you owe something uh, to Frege's reinvention of logic. F logic went on for 2,500 years, uh, well, to, uh, roughly speaking, to over 2,000 years, with nobody making any changes to it. Frege simply revolutionized the whole subject. A and most of the courses, uh, the, any course you take in the United States today, is effectively Frege's uh, logic, and they will never mention his name. Uh, the instructors probably never heard of him and can't pronounce his name, but that's ultimate success. Uh, one of my students was studying games theory, and I said, well, what do you think of von Neumann and Morgenstern? She'd never heard of them. Now, I, this is the ultimate success, is when the, the thing you invent becomes so famous in its own right, people forget that you invented it. Uh, and when Neumann and Morgenstern invented games theory, but m most of you who study games theory today probably never heard of von Neumann and Morgenstern. But anyway, now you have. Okay, back to answering your question. The answer is this. All representation is under an aspect, and when the state is totally unconscious, when, when the state is totally, un when your brain is totally unconscious, there's nothing going on in the brain except neurobiological processes. 
what fact about those neurobiological processes gives them one aspect rather than another? This is the argument for the connection principle. And the answer is some of those neurobiological processes are capable of causing the state in a conscious form. Uh, and they will cause one aspect rather than another. So if you unconsciously uh, desire water but don't desire H2O, and there's no aspectual shape then and there in your brain, to say that is to say that you're in a state which is such that if you thought about it or if, we, if you brought it to consciousness, you would represent it as water and not as H2O. Do you get, yes, yeah, say some more, because this is absolutely crucial. Yeah. Exactly. Now here is the, the next step of the argument. What fact makes those states mental when they're totally unconscious? See, when they're totally unconscious, there's just a bunch of neurological configurations and they talk about things like uh, increasing the synaptic strength. Well, okay, what does that mean? That the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the synapses are better able uh, to, fi uh, uh, to fire when the neurotransmitters hit the synapses. What fact makes them mental? See, the notion of the mental is taken to be unproblematic, but it's a very problematic notion. If you're going to say, the, the subject is following a rule. That's a mental attribution. The subject has an unconscious representation of the rule and that then follows the rule. And it does this on the basis of its unconscious belief. Now, the question I'm asking is, when the subject is totally unconscious, when, when she is absolutely sound asleep with no uh, conscious states at all, what fact about her brain makes such and such states mental states? See, the notion of the unconscious is not an unproblematic notion. It's a puzzling notion. And I'm suggesting the only way we can make sense of it is to treat it dispositionally, is to suppose that when you say that the subject has an unconscious mental state, her brain is totally unconscious, she's completely out, uh, but all the same, when she's totally unconscious, she still believes, it's still true to say of her, that she believes that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Now, that's her belief, and not, <coughs> uh, she does, that's not the same belief as the belief that Martha Washington's husband uh, was the political leader of the newly independent country founded on the 13 colonies. That's, that represents the same state of affairs, but with a different aspectual shape, because the, the representation is under different aspects. If I represent George as Martha's husband rather than as George Washington. Okay, so the, the, the crucial question is to ask yourself, what is our notion of the mental? What fact about these states makes them mental states when they're totally unconscious? And the only answer I can come up with that is, uh, I, for that is to say, our notion of an unconscious mental state is a notion of a dispositional capacity of the brain to produce something in a conscious form. Now, oddly enough, on this particular issue, I'm sort of on the side of Freud. I'm not a great fan of Freud, but he see, seems to me he understood this. He saw I, uh, that uh, the, uh, the notion of the unconscious, if it makes any sense, has to be understood uh, on the model of conscious states. Now, he then said something outrageously false, and I, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but he said, we ought to think of mental states as in themselves unconscious, and then we bring them to consciousness by something, by an action that's analogous to perception. That's wrong. It's not at all like perception, but I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Other question, did you have your hand up? No. Um, yes, you had your hand up. Yeah. Shape, but yeah. The book, that that other third or is okay, let me state this point precisely. When the state is totally unconscious, there is no aspectual shape present then and there. All the same, it's true to say, even when the guy's totally unconscious, he wants water, but he doesn't want H2O. He's a kind of hippie guy, and he doesn't, well, you know, he's a California, the old school, doesn't want any chemicals. He just wants water. No chemicals, please. Uh, okay. Now, that guy, when he's totally unconscious, all the same, it's true to say of him that he wants water and not H2O. What fact makes it the case 
that he has that aspectual shape when there is no aspectual shape present then and there in the case of an unconscious mental state. When, when it's just, there is no aspectual shape in the neurobiology. Okay, and I'm saying the answer to that has to be given in terms of its capacity. Just as I have a capacity to ski, <clears throat> even though I'm not skiing right now, so his brain has the capacity <clears throat> to produce the thought in a conscious form, even though it isn't in that form right here and now. I, I hope that answered the question, because it's a crucial question. You're next. <clears throat> Yeah, there are some that are inaccessible <clears throat> because, for example, they're too painful. Uh, I mean, this is why people pay a psychoanalyst, you know, to get their beliefs out after five years of analysis. I don't know that they're better off, but anyway, that's. I don't want to say that <clears throat> you can't have an un inaccessible belief because I think people do. For example, because of brain damage or something like that. And I think uh, the uh, the woman who had the brain damage who was able. Remember, I gave you the example where she can't see the right-hand side of the picture, so she can't see the flames coming out of that cabin, uh, even though she unconsciously is aware that there's some difference between these two, because if you ask her, <clears throat> would you rather live in A or B, she always says, I'd rather live in B. And, and if you ask, well, why? What's better? Well, it just looks nicer, you know. B, B looks like it's more fun. Now, <clears throat> the standard explanation for these kind of cases, and it sounds right to me, is to say there's more than one visual pathway. And only one of them, or not, oh, I'll put it, I don't want to say that, not all of them are conscious. The standard account now. Remember, I gave you the example of Larry Weisskrantz and blind sight. Now, in the case of blind sight, the subject, in some sense, knows that there is an X or a, an O on the, on the screen uh, because he makes a guess. He, he gets it, and he gets it right 90, over 90% of the time. He unconsciously perceives it. But to say he unconsciously perceives it is to say that he has the kind of input which is, in principle, capable of being conscious. What's the difference between saying that my uh, visual system gives me this unconscious information uh, and saying that the stomach uh, has unconscious information about the chemical composition of the pizza that you just ate? And the answer, uh, to put it very simply, is there's no mental reality uh, to the stomach. Uh, that's a metaphor. Uh, a digestion scientists do talk about what a smart organ the stomach is. One of my students gave me a beautiful passage, uh, which I quoted in one of my books, uh, where the, uh, the pharmacologists say, the stomach is a very intelligent organ because it makes all these complex decisions about the chemical stuff coming in. Well, I, 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 <clears throat> my stomach isn't that smart, okay? It doesn't make any, it has no mental life uh, at all. Uh, it does affect my mental life, I can tell you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, as far as the stomach operation itself is concerned, there's no mental reality at all, because it's not the kind of thing that's accessible to consciousness. Incidentally, there are a couple of million neurons in the stomach. What the hell are they doing there? It's some evolutionary survival. Okay, other questions? All those are good questions. You have another one. Can you also explain about music? Yes, okay. Now remember, this whole discussion presupposes a distinction between honest to John, real, non-fake, non-metaphorical intentionality, I'm really hungry or really thirsty, and the metaphorical or as-if attributions of intentionality. So it makes perfectly good sense metaphorically to say, well, the problem with a Porsche engine is it's very thirsty for gasoline. It's too damn thirsty uh, for a car of that size. But now that's a metaphor. Literally, there is no, thir I, I hate to say this, but even the Porsche has no mental life. Uh, none at all. A Porsche owners are convinced somehow there's a soul 
in there, but I have to tell them, no, in your serious moments, when you're actually doing philosophy and not just uh, revving, uh, revving the engine, there is no mental life at all. Uh, it's a metaphor, that's metaphorical. Now, similarly, when I say of my computer, the one I have now has a much better memory than the one that I had before. It does, this is true. That's a metaphor. It doesn't mean, at last, Proust has been equaled. Just as when I plug in the word processing program, so the computer will have the same kind of experience that Proust had when he ate the madeleine uh, mixed with the hot tea. If you don't know Proust, you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, and suddenly all of his memory came back, all of his life. Now, my, my computer has no such experience because it doesn't have any experience at all. It's perfectly okay to talk, to use an intentionalistic vocabulary about the computer. It knows this and doesn't know that. It remembers this and doesn't remember that. It's all metaphorical. There's no mental reality at all in, in the computer uh, that... I, in the Lenovo that I bought now. Now, who knows? Maybe someday, well, people will make machines that are conscious, but the ones we have now are not conscious. They're not designed to be conscious. Okay, that's the difference between the as if, on the one hand, the metaphorical, the computer remembers the car is thirsty, and the literal or intrinsic, I am thirsty, I remember. Now, there's another distinction you need to get, and that is the distinction between intrinsic intentionality and derived intentionality. My state of thirst is intrinsically intentional. It couldn't be that state if it wasn't a state of thirst. But this sentence is a French sentence that means I'm thirsty. Now the fact it really does mean that. That is, it's, uh, I, what I said is true. It has that intentionality. It has those conditions of satisfaction. But the intentionality in the sentence is derived. It's derived from French speakers. So you need a distinction between the intrinsic, intrinsic versus as if or metaphorical. But in addition to that, among, within the intrinsic, you need a distinction between, let's just say this way, you need a distinction between the derived and the intrinsic, or some people call this original, the original intentionality. So you need these two distinctions. Intrinsic is opposed not only to as if, but also to derived uh, or um, observer relative intentionality. The intentionality in the sentence, see, the English, I am thirsty, and the French, je soif, have the same intentionality, but it's not intrinsic. In both cases, it's derived or imposed by the speakers of the language. And what's the German? Ich habe Durst. Uh, same intentionality, but a different sentential structure. And in both cases, in all three cases, the, the intentionality is imposed. It's not intrinsic. It's not, intri it's not intrinsic to that sentence. Why intrinsic? Why that word? It couldn't be this very state if it wasn't a state of thirst. But it could be that very sentence and mean something different. Now, a lot of people are outraged when I use the word intrinsic because it sounds mystical or sounds mysterious. Fine. Use original, then, if you don't like intrinsic. Did you have your hand up, Jim? Yeah. When somebody says that they're thirsty, they're not Yes, <clears throat> even though water is identical with H2O. Right. But somebody said, I agree that all representations have an essential shape, but I think that amounts to just you know, how they're going to, what they're going to cause, you know, syntactic features or something like that. Yeah. So I think you can have two different representations, one H2O, 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 Yeah, but we, uh, this is functionalism, uh, I guess. And we went over all the objections to that. That is, it can't deal uh, with the fact that the same uh, functional role 
could be had by two different mental states. I mean, you remember, we went, I went through a whole series of those. So for example, one of them is the red-green spectrum inversion. Uh, I, the, this, the, the person who says, uh, I have, I, I see the light turn from red to green might have a completely different experience even though the functional role is exactly the same if you imagine a red-green inversion. And the ultimate of that view is strong AI and I thought I gave some arguments against that. So have another try. Yeah. So, so functional role is one example of a kind of Yeah. More, right? So do you have a general argument against saying this uh, aspectual shape can be just a matter of some feature? Of yeah, the because the, uh, the, the argument that I give in the book, you remember, is no purely third personal account will be sufficient to discriminate aspectual shape. Uh, the only uh, way of discriminating different aspectual shapes is in terms of consciousness. Now, the best, most powerful argument for that inadvertently was given by Quine. Uh, he, had, he was trying to prove the opposite, uh, but uh, that is to say he was trying to uh, prove a point about behaviorism, but I think it's, the result is an anti-behavioristic result. And I, 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 I don't want to spend a lot of time on Quine, but let me mention this. Quine points out that the evidence we have is always insufficient for us to ascribe a definite meaning uh, to some speaker. <clears throat> and Quine imagines that the field linguist goes into the Amazon jungle. And in the Amazon jungle, he encounters some natives. And while he's talking to these natives, a rabbit runs past, and the native, when the rabbit runs past, shouts, Gabba guy. Now, the, na the linguist thinks, aha, by the word Gabba guy, they mean rabbit. But then, if he's a philosophical linguist, he'll think, but wait a second, maybe what they mean is stage in the life history of a rabbit. Because that's all that the guy saw was a stage in the life history of a rabbit. Or maybe he's uh, uh, interested in pieces of rabbit, and so what he really meant by Gabba guy was undetached rabbit parts. Because that's all he saw was undetached rabbit parts. Or maybe he's a Platonist, and what he really meant was instantiation of the Platonic universal rabbit uh, rabbitness, okay. Or maybe he thinks of rabbiting as an activity, and what we saw was this activity going on, rabbiteth. The damn thing is rabbiting or rabbitething. Uh, we translate it, as Quine says, as low a rabbit, but all these other translations are just as good. Now, says Quine, <coughs> it's no good thinking that you can learn uh, the uh, language uh, because the same indeterminacy will infect any learning that you do of the language. You will still have an indeterminacy as to whether or not the, uh, innate, whether or not other people mean exactly the same as you do. And it's no good if saying, well, you could see that he didn't mean uh, stage in the life history of a rabbit if you got the same rabbit to go past and he said the word for same gava guy because you still have the same problem over again. What does he mean by same? Just as there was a problem about translating gava guy, so there's a problem about same. Now, says Quine, where meaning is concerned, there simply is no fact of the matter. Why does he say that? Because he says, the behavior is, fails to distinguish between saying Gabba guy and meaning rabbit and saying Gabba guy and meaning stage in the life history of a rabbit, undetached rabbit parts, activity of rabbiting, instantiation of the Platonic universal rabbithood, and so on, all these other possibilities. Now this is regarded as one of Quine's most important uh, discoveries, uh, that the, the behavior is insufficient to distinguish different meanings. Therefore, says Quine, there is no difference. There is no fact of the matter about whether the agent meant rabbit or stage in the life history of a rabbit. 
Now, I think, in fact, the argument shows exactly the reverse. What it shows is behaviorism is incapable of discriminating things that we know are different. It is in, incapable of discriminating uh, between saying Gavagayan meaning rabbit and saying Gavagayan meaning undetached rabbit parts. If Quine were right, if there really were no difference, then we shouldn't be able to hear the argument when he says, well, maybe he didn't mean rabbit, maybe he meant stage in the life history of a rabbit. I should have said, huh? Quine, what's the difference? Stage in the life history of a rabbit? I can't hear any difference. The fact that we can hear the difference between stage in the life history of a rabbit and a rabbit is already an indication that the behavior is insufficient to discriminate things we know are discriminable. We understand the example precisely because we know that we mean rabbit and not stage in the life history of a rabbit. Uh, I never thought about stages in the life history of a rabbit until I read Quine. It never occurred to me that somebody might think about this and mean undetached parts of a rabbit, instantiation of the, I mean, these are a lot of fun. You can keep thinking of them. You only see one side of the rabbit at a time and so on. Uh, but what that shows is that you don't get the aspectual shape out of the behavior. Okay, now the general point is this. <clears throat> There is no third person analysis, either in terms of behavior or neurobiology, that is sufficient to discriminate what intentional contents, aspectual shape, that we know are in fact different. Now the strongest case would be the, the neurobiology. Suppose that we had our brainoscope and we put our brainoscope on the eyes, on the guy's brain, and we see, aha! He means rabbit. He doesn't mean stage in the life history of a rabbit. All the same, I want to say, you still have an inference because what you're doing is inferring from the neurobiological state to the aspectual shape. So the conclusion that I draw is there is no purely third personal account that is sufficient to discriminate aspectual shapes that we know aren't in fact, different. Now, this, I mean, I'm making a familiar argument against functionalism, uh, but I've, it, one, it, what is different about it is that an argument that's supposed to refute intentionalism, Quine's argument against about the, it's called the indeterminacy of translation, uh, that that argument uh, it, uh, shows the opposite of what it's supposed to show. What it suppo uh, shows is the bankruptcy of behaviorism for the analysis of intentionality. When I was working on this book, Intentionality, I got obsessed by the fact, well, there are all these people who are skeptical about the existence of intentionality at all. They think they, maybe the whole thing is a Cartesian uh, fantasy, like the soul or something like that. You can't believe in intrinsic intentionality. Uh, and the two most famous arguments against it uh, were Quine's argument about indeterminacy and uh, uh, Kripke's uh, argument about private languages. So I got so exasperated by these that I actually wrote articles attacking them. And if you want to read them, I, I wrote an article. It's got a real catchy title. It's called uh, Indeterminacy, Empiricism, and the First Person. And I'm sure you can find it on the web. It's kind of boring to read it if you're not interested in all this stuff. Uh, and <clears throat> the other one is called Skepticism About Rules and Intentionality. And again, I, I, I've, uh, those are, both of those articles are published. So if you're interested in my at answers to skeptical arguments about in, in, uh, intentionality. Uh, Kripke and Quine both have skeptical arguments. I think both arguments fail. I have to tell you a funny story. <clears throat> I had to give a lecture in Geneva, and I asked the organizer, now what's the audience like? I mean, is this a sort of high-powered professional audience, or is it the general public? He said, oh, very high-powered professional audience. Well, it turns out it was mostly society ladies from Geneva. Uh, and it's true, they do have great intellectual pretensions, but not much, <laughs> uh, not a great deal of philosophical sophistication. So I gave an attack on the indeterminacy argument, and my wife heard one of them speaking to another uh, after the thing was over, and she said, it seems that this analytic philosophy is rather superficial. It's all about rabbits. 
Uh, I, I mean, she was being French. Il s'agit des lapins. Uh, they're all busy worrying about rabbits. You know, what has happened to philosophy if rabbits, well, anyway, I don't have to tell you about, uh, any more about that. Il s'agit des lapins. C'est superficiel, ce philosophie analytique. Uh, uh, I won't uh, go through the whole, uh, the, uh, the, the French of this. Uh, okay, so anyway, there's um, obviously more to be said. Now, the answer, one answer to me is yes, but the argument isn't absolutely decisive. Somebody might come up with a third person account. I don't think so, but I haven't. It's true. I, 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 you can't prove a universal negative. Uh, all I can show is that existing third person accounts, even either in terms of neurobiology or behavior, are insufficient to discriminate as spectral shape. Okay, here we go with the VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex. Now, the reason I like this example is we actually, it's a beautiful example, and we actually understand it. You can demonstrate this example by fixing your eye on some object in the room, uh, preferably find something attractive, and then raise your head up and down or move it left and right, up and down or left and right, and what you will find is, that your eye remains focused even though your head is moving. Now, <clears throat> this uh, eye movement uh, of your eye, whereby the eye, it doesn't seem to you that your eye is moving. It seems your eyes remain the same. Uh, but in fact, relative to the eye socket, the eyeball moves. And it's called the vestibular ocular reflex and us professionals call it the VOR. The vestibular ocular reflex seems to be a case of the brain following a beautiful and simple rule. And it is this. Move the eyeball exactly equal and opposite to the movement of the head. So if your head moves 30 degrees to the right, the eyeball moves 30 degrees to the left and so on with the up and down movements. There's a, a mathematically beautiful rule of the vestibular ocular reflex whereby uh, the eyeball moves exactly equal and opposite to the movement of the head. Now, <laughs> you can show uh, that this rule is predictive and that it's systematic uh, by doing certain tricks, and they do these nasty tricks to primates if you rig the primate up with lenses that are either miniaturizing or magnifying, there's a guy named at uh, San Francisco uh, at UCSF who did this, his name is Lisberger, uh, and you rig up uh, the a pr poor primate with uh, magnifying or miniaturizing lenses, then you'll find after a time that the brain adjusts uh, and it moves uh, the eyeball uh, more. Uh, than equal and opposite, or less than equal and opposite, to compensate for what the lenses are doing to your vision. The point, however, is it looks like you have meaningful uh, behavior, and the behavior is a matter of following a rule. That is what a classical cognitive scientist, I think, would have to say. There's an unconscious rule, and this is a case of unconscious rule following. The problem is that's not how it works. We know how it works. There is a reflex. Uh, it is, uh, <clears throat> you remember the, old, the inner ear, the old uh, uh, semicircular canals that you learned about in high school? I remember almost nothing from high school, but I did remember at one point we had to learn about the semicircular canals. Well, when you move your head, the semicircular canals set up an impulse that goes over the eighth cranial nerve to the cerebellum. And in the cerebellum, there's a complex set of neurobiological processes that take place that simply move the eyeball equal and opposite to the movement of the head. The movement of the head sets up the signals, and this goes over the, uh, into the cerebellum, and in the cerebellum, the signal goes out that moves uh, the eyeball relative to the movement of the head. It is a reflex. It's not a matter of intentionality at all. There is no intentionality in the vestibular ocular reflex, even though it certainly looks very intelligent. It looks like this is a case of intelligent behavior 
uh, on the part of the organism, and it looks like a case of rule following. Indeed, the rule is predictive, it's uh, flexible. As I said, you can alter it uh, by putting on miniaturizing or magnet magnifying lenses. But this is an example of the connection principle in operation. There are neurobiological processes, and there is intentionality. But in this case, uh, I think we have very good evidence that the appearance of a rule that mediates the one from the other is an illusion. We know how it works. It works as a reflex. Now, this is going to be very important when we talk about Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. Chomsky is struck by an interesting fact. Children of all different cultures can equally easily learn the language of their culture even though the languages are enormously different. Furthermore, they do it on the basis of very limited data, and they do it at a time in their lives when they're not gen generally intellectually sophisticated. Tiny little kids will learn to speak English, but they won't learn axiomatic set theory. Try to teach axiomatic set theory to a one-year-old, or even a two-year-old, or a three-year-old, no luck at all. But learning English, uh, they just do it automatically, and English is much more complicated than axiomatic set theory. It's, so the child acquires an extremely complex intellectual structure, does it without any training. It, I mean, uh, middle-class parents sometimes have the illusion that they taught the kid English, and I must have been an undergraduate before I gave up the uh, the conviction that I had really taught Billy Boy, that's my little brother, how to speak. It must be awful to be a little brother. I didn't have a big brother, but I, I thought, I'm sure I taught him how to read, but for a long time I thought I also taught him how to speak English. Uh, but in fact, I have to give up this cherished illusion. The kid learns without any uh, instruction that ch a child automatically picks up language. It's not a function of intelligence. Uh, the bright kids and the dumb kids both learn the same language. Uh, the smarter kids tend to have bigger vocabularies, uh, but by and large, uh, the acquisition of English or Chinese or whatever it is, is done uh, in a way that's not a function of intelligence. Now, what's the explanation? These are remarkable facts, if you think about them. I mean, let's, we might as well list them on the blackboard. The acquisition of a human language is done that has the following features. Uh, the child acquires an extremely complex structure, acquires it at an early age before there is any general cognitive or intellectual development, does it without teaching, no active teaching is necessary not a function of intelligence, so the child gets this complicated structure at, at a very early stage of development where there's no uh, effort to teach the child and it is not a function of the child's overall general intelligence. And furthermore, uh, there are many diverse languages and the child can acquire any one of them, any one that it's exposed to. Now, this was a bit tricky when I say uh, no teaching is necessary. You have to have interaction uh, with other uh, conspecifics. If, the, if you just plop the kid in front of a television set, it, it won't learn English. It has to be able to respond uh, to other uh, human beings. Uh, and that's an important fact. OK, but now there's another feature at a certain age of development because if the child gets to adolescence without acquiring a first language, it's very hard, in fact, apparently impossible uh, to teach the child. There was a horrible story uh, in Los Angeles uh, where uh, the parents kept their daughter <clears throat> in a closet until she was 14 years old and she never acquired uh, English. And uh, the UCLA Linguistics Department got a hold of her and tried to teach her 
uh, to speak. And they, they, did the, they did a beautiful job on this. They kept it out of the newspapers. Uh, they didn't publicize it in any way. And the person who was responsible for take, I forget the girl's name, but the person who is responsible for doing such a good job is Vicki Fromkin. I don't know what happened to her, I haven't seen her in years, she may be retired or whatever, but, but Vicki Fromkin, more than anybody else, was responsible for trying to teach this girl English. And she did learn a little bit, but it was pretty fragile. And then a, a, another horrible thing happened. The parents got her back. Uh, they went, they took the case to course, even though they had behaved in a monstrous way, they got the child back, and the child lost what little language uh, that she had acquired. It'd be worth looking up the case. But anyway, uh, the importance for our present discussion is, <clears throat> if you don't learn it at a certain stage of development, if you get to adolescence without learning a first language, it's virtually impossible for you to acquire a language. And one thing that's obvious, <clears throat> the mechanisms by which you learn a language after the age of 14 are quite different from the mechanisms by which you're learning it at the age of two. At the age of two, the child picks up uh, <clears throat> a, 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 a huge increase in vocabulary in a short space of time. Now, there are kids that are a bit slow. Uh, in my own case, I never said a word until I was two and a half. Uh, and everybody in the family uh, was worried about this, except my mother, who was a medical doctor, and she knows perfectly, not, nothing to worry about. Everybody else was worried, that kid won't talk, my God. Uh, but anyway, I started at two and a half and haven't stopped. Uh, <laughs> but I, it, it has to come at a certain age, and there has to be, there is a certain pattern of development. Now, how are we gonna explain this? These are remarkable facts. Um, and Chomsky says, and he follows the 17th century rationalists in this, he says, there must be in the child an innate mechanism that enables the child to learn language. The mechanism has to be specific to the human species, because you can't teach uh, English uh, to chimpanzees, or you can't teach it to your dog. You can have uh, all sorts of intelligent behavior on the part of other animals, but it seems to be specific to the species. So Chomsky says, and again, this seems to me very plausible, <coughs> that there is a language acquisition device which is innate to the human species, and each of us has in the brain a language acquisition device. Now, so far, so good. I'm with him all the way. But then he says something that seems to me much more doubtful. The language acquisition device consists in a set of rules of universal grammar, of UG. Uh, and how then do we cope with the fact that languages are so different? Well, the answer is supposed to be they're different on the surface, but the deep structure of all languages is pretty much the same. All, and, and there are a lot of commonalities that ought to interest us. All languages have sentences. Uh, sentences have noun phrases and verb phrases. And even more controversially, uh, the noun uh, tends to dominate the verb in the rules of the grammar. So how you conjugate the verb depends on what the noun is. So uh, the, the standard MIT argument when I worked with Chomsky on this stuff was that languages are not very different. In fact, Chomsky says, it's an interesting idea, if a Martian linguist could come and look at human beings, the Martian linguist would say, they all speak the same language, they just have different vocabularies. Uh, vocabulary in Paris is different from the vocabulary in Berkeley, but effectively the language is the same. Occasionally there are superficial differences. Uh, we say the White House and they say the House White. Well, you know, what are you going to do with the French? Um, but but, but the, 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 ling the linguist would say it's the same language. They, they just have different vocabularies. So the idea was that all uh, human languages are really manifestations of a common, of a common underlying universal grammar which is common to all human languages. Okay, that's where I get suspicious. Uh, it seems to me precisely to the extent 
that there is a commonality, that the language acquisition device is absolutely neutral between languages, it seems to me to that extent, to the extent that there is a commonality that's universal, you don't need to postulate rules. You don't need rules. Consider vision. Uh, human vision uh, is common to all members of the species, and there are certain principles on which it operates. So for example, it is impossible for you uh, to see infrared or ultraviolet. But is that because you are following a rule unconsciously, if it's infrared, don't see it, or if it's ultraviolet, don't see it? No, it's just that's not how the system is structured. The system is structured so that you can't see infrared or ultraviolet. I suppose some species can, but that's not because there's a rule. There isn't any rule. You don't need a rule. It's true you have to acquire a lot of brain development in vision. Now, the brain has. The child has, the brain has to be affected by the visual experience in such a way that certain things become possible and others not. But there are no rules of visual grammar that are common to all members of the species. Now I want to say in the same way, it is not necessary to postulate rules of universal grammar. And in fact, no clear sense has been given to this anyway, because it's not clear how these are supposed to operate in real time with aspectual shape. Now, what has happened, I'm not clear about, and those of you who study linguistics ought to check this out. They gave up on universal grammar when uh, a guy named Ken Hale, and Ken, uh, I didn't know this guy personally, but he was one of these guys who can pick up a new language in a couple of weeks. You know, I mean, there are people like that who have a kind of genius for acquiring languages. He went into the Australian, Australian outback uh, and picked up some of those languages and he said they do not have the same structure uh, as the languages that, we were, that we're all familiar with. They really do have a different structure. So instead of giving up on universal grammar, what Chomsky did was modify it and say, well, it isn't that there's a common set of rules common to all languages, but rather that the language acquisition device has a set of principles, and these principles are common. Uh, these principles uh, are innate in the human brain. And then when the child is exposed to French as opposed to German or English, the principles ha will have certain switches that are set in certain ways and not others. So the principles will confront the data of, exper of experience and then the data of experience will give to those principles a set of parameters. So think of the language acquisition device as a huge piece of machinery in the brain. Now, we're all born with the same piece of machinery. But when you are exposed to English, a whole lot of switches on the machinery are set in a certain way. So out comes English. A whole lot of parameters are set that are ways of fixing the switches on the machinery. So the universal grammar view was replaced with the principles and parameters view. And that was a way of dealing with the fact that there are languages that just don't meet uh, the uh, uh, early MIT conception of a universal grammar. When I worked with these guys at MIT, there used to be a joke in Building 20 where people would say, all languages are really English, <clears throat> except English, which is Latin. Uh, and the idea was, since they only knew English, uh, these guys, and for the most part, they knew a certain New York dialect of English, uh, they were anxious to see that all languages could really be assimilated uh, to the paradigm. Uh, but in fact, it turned out they couldn't. Uh, that Ken Hale uh, discovered that there are all kinds of languages in Australia that just don't meet this. They don't meet these constraints. But they preserved the notion of the language acquisition device by giving up the theory of universal grammar and replacing it with a theory of principles and parameters. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I mean, this, I think this is still a debate we're having. What is the nature of the language acquisition device? But one thing I'm confident of is it is unnecessary and indeed incoherent to suppose that we are following a lot of deep unconscious rules, rules that are not, that are not even accessible. 
uh, to consciousness in principle. And one of the things that ought to make us suspicious is that they were always extremely embarrassed to actually give you rules of universal grammar. Uh, there weren't, as far as I know, there weren't any that everybody agreed, that all competent linguists agreed were rules of universal grammar. Chomsky said, well, maybe some of them are formal rules having to do with the arrangement of elements. So for example, the rules don't tell you what color vocabulary uh, you have to have, uh, but it uh, tells you that in your color vocabulary, you have to identify elements of the spectrum that are next to each other. So there won't be a language with a single word that means either red or green, but there'll be one for red, orange, violet, blue, and, and uh, uh, lumps of the color spectrum are picked up. Well, maybe so, but there would be other explanations, purely practical explanations uh, for that, if it is indeed a linguistic universal. Okay, now, so far all of this lecture has been devoted to a single question, and that is, what does cognitive science look like if I'm right about the connection principle? And I want to say, in a way, it becomes a much richer and more interesting subject, because what we're interested in is how the human mind operates to organize, both to organize our experiences and to organize our perceptual uh, uh, inputs in, with other cognitive mechanisms, such as the ability to learn a language, the ability to remember experiences you've had, the ability to acquire physical skills. Uh, so I think that, uh, I, and I think something like this is happening. You now have two levels of explanation in cognitive science. You have a psychological level, uh, and if you look at Steve Palmer's book on uh, perception, you'll have a lot of examples of how that operates. And then you have a neurobiological level, and within uh, both of those, there are a whole lot of subsidiary levels. The mistake was to suppose that there's something intermediate between the level of neurobiology and the level of intentionality, such as unconscious information processing or computational uh, uh, processes being implemented in the brain, et cetera. Okay, however, now there's a real problem. On my own account, if you have these intentional states, they only work because you have a set of skills and abilities and tendencies and dispositions that are not themselves more intentional states. And that I call the background. In addition to the network of your thoughts, of things you're actually thinking about, both conscious and unconscious, I, you have a set of abilities, capacities, tendencies, dispositions, know-how, ways of behaving, ways of responsing, and that I call the background. Now this I regard, the, the discussion of the background I regard as the least satisfactory feature of my account of the mind. I think it's important, but I, uh, it's still a bit vague. So let's go through what it is, what are the arguments for it, and how does it work. Okay, before I do that, are there any questions now about the connection principle, the deep uh, uh, unconscious and all of that kind of stuff. You see, there are several different notions of the unconscious. First of all, there's the notion of things you just don't happen to be thinking about. I'm not thinking about uh, the fact that George Washington was the first president, but all the same, I do have that belief. Uh, then there's the Freudian unconscious, the cases that are where you're actually uh, repressed, where you, uh, you don't want to think about it. It's too painful or too, uh, uh, it makes you uh, upset to think about it. Okay, but th those seem to me in various ways perfectly uh, legitimate. Uh, and then uh, there are cases of abilities that you have acquired that you're not actually thinking about. But the f finally, though, there is a set of supposed cases which are unconscious mental processes, and they're genuinely mental, but they're not the kind of thing that anybody could ever become, become conscious of, because, for example, uh, there are computational rules of enormous uh, uh, complexity, lots of zeros and ones flashing through your brain. And I've argued that that last point, the deep unconscious, that that makes no sense, that that violates the connection principle, that there's no mental reality at that level. It would have to be as if intentionality or metaphorical. 
Now I'm going to talk about the background. So let's have questions about what I've said so far, about the connection principle and explanatory models, and about the innateness hypothesis. By the way, Chomsky, he was invented all this. He objects to the expression innateness hypothesis on the grounds that anybody's theory of language acquisition, even the Hume's theory, uh, extreme empiricism, has to suppose there's some innate mechanism. Now Hume has to say you associate ideas by resemblance and causation. So Chomsky objects to the idea of calling this the innateness hypothesis, but I think it's perfectly reasonable. What it says is there's a rich innate mechanism uh, that enables you uh, to acquire a human language, and it seems reasonable to suppose there are other rich innate mechanisms in the brain that enable you to have certain kinds of experiences and not others. The, the debate is about what exactly is in the mechanism, and I'm saying it's a mistake to suppose it consists of a lot of deep unconscious rules. However, now I've got a problem. What about the background? What is it? Why do we need it? How, how does it work? What's the evidence for it? Let's take questions first. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, I think that's a very good point. I think it's absolutely right, but I, they don't, none of these guys accept it. Uh, and it's one of the things, uh, by these guys, I mean Quine and Davidson also was a believer in indeterminacy. So let me go over it. What about my own case? Surely I know the difference between meaning rabbit and meaning stage in the life history of a rabbit. And I, I think that's absolutely right. I, we couldn't understand it if that weren't true. But here's their answer. Their answer, and Davidson addresses this explicitly. He says, language is by its very nature public. And there can't be anything in my semantic knowledge that, is, that I can't communicate. So there can't be any knowledge that I have which is impossible for me to communicate to other people because of the publicity of language. Now, I think uh, that's, uh, that sounds right, but it isn't right, uh, because there is, for other people, an other mind's problem, what's going on in their mind, which I don't have for myself. But how then do I deal with Quine's objection that the evidence you have that the guy meant rabbit is perfectly consistent with a hypothesis that he meant stage in the life history of a rabbit. And the answer to that, and this is a crucial point I didn't make earlier, but I want to make it now, and that is you need to distinguish between underdetermination, where the evidence you have is consistent with alternative and inconsistent hypotheses. You need to distinguish between that and indeterminacy. According to indeterminacy, there is no fact of the matter to be right or wrong about. There's no fact about what the guy meant. Now, it seems to me clear that about other people's meaning, I have underdetermination. What you mean is underdetermined by the evidence. But this is true in knowledge generally. It's underdetermined by uh, the evidence, and certainly in the sciences. The scientific hypothesis is always underdetermined by the evidence for it in a perfectly strict sense. Namely, alternative hypotheses are equally consistent with that evidence. Uh, I, uh, famously, you can make the Ptolemaic theory of the uh, of astronomy work you just, uh, if you just make all you have to fiddle with it you have to postulate all kinds of epicycles and so on but the fact that the hypothesis uh, is consistent that alternative and inconsistent hypotheses are all consistent with the same evidence and indeed with I with an infinite amount with all possible evidence doesn't show that there's no fact of the matter. There plainly is a fact of the matter. The Ptolemaic theory is false, uh, and the, and the uh, heliocentric theory is right, uh, and the fact that one can be made consistent with, the, each can be made consistent with the evidence does not show there's no fact of the matter. So, to put the, to summarize this, in 
any other mind situation. Is Sally really in love? Does Billy uh, really uh, like me? Uh, does uh, Sam really mean rabbit when he says rabbit? There's always a problem about the underdetermination of the hypothesis by the evidence available, because some other hypothesis will be equally consistent with that evidence. But it doesn't follow from that that there's no fact of the matter. There's a fact of the matter I, about which of these I meant, even though alternative hypotheses about the fact of the matter will be consistent with the available evidence. Yes, alternative hypotheses are consistent with the evidence. All the same, there's a, a correct hypothesis and a wrong hypothesis. Now, it's very important to emphasize this because, as I'm sure you know, there's always a kind of relativism that tends to rear its head. And the relativism goes, well, really, there aren't any truths in the sciences or in anything else. We just find it convenient to say certain things. It's more practically useful to say uh, that the Earth rotates on its axis rather than that the sun is busy going around the, around the Earth. That's a mistake. And one of the grounds of the mistake is to suppose, well, you could always hold alternative hypotheses that are, uh, hypotheses that are consistent with the evidence. Okay, I think you're handing in your paper uh, today.